Welcome to this week's Sam Pile. This week we're going to talk about accessibility. And I'm, uh, I have a list of questions and, and comments and some experience that I'm going to share, and hopefully that will uh, generate some conversation. So feel free if you have something to say, either put it in the chat or grab the mic and let me know what you think. But uh, again, I do have a list of things that might lead us, uh, might lead us where we want to go. So the driving thing behind this is recently one of our clients was hit with a uh, with a class action lawsuit or became drawn into a class action lawsuit where their website was defined as not accessible. Uh, I'll go into more details later, but that led us to uh, to have a good hard look at what we're doing. And I'm, uh, I guess, in Chicago Digital, I'm trying to lead the charge on get, making sure that at least the framework that we start with is uh, is accessible and then the, the sites that we build in the end are considered accessible. So what does a website being accessible mean? So I went to uh, the w3.org site and there's, uh, there's a link which I'll put in, this, in the show notes as it were. It says web accessibility means that websites, tools and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. More specifically, people can perceive, understand, navigate and interact with the web. So it's a, a rather specific example, but that's, that's, that's the W3's definition of accessibility. And web accessibility encompasses all disabilities that affect access to the web, including auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speech, and visual. And of course, it, uh, it does go on and, and, and talks about web accessibility also benefits people without disabilities. Uh, which is fine, but that's uh, that's the the large, overarching definition of, uh, of what an accessible website means. So it was also interesting to me to to look at the uh, the current laws. Most of them, if not all of them, reference the WCAG 2.0, and that stands for what does that stand for? Just give me a sec. Yeah, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and it's version 2.0. So that seems to be the, the standard that, that uh, all of the specifications are, are referring to. Um, you'll also hear things like Section 508, which is effective January 2018. And what it says basically is that the federal government or any business that does business with the federal government must apply or must uh, comply with WCAG 2.0 regulations. So that just went into effect uh, as, a, as a law, at least in my understanding, I'm from Canada, so I don't know US law all that well, but it seems to be uh, in place in law in the, in the United States for January 2018. Now the WCAG 2.0 is divided into four main principles. And uh, if you, if you uh, again, if you start to look this stuff up, you'll see it's broken into perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. That seems to be the four qualitative or quantitative measures that they're using. And then within that, there's three different levels: A, double A, and triple A. Uh, with each one getting progressively more specific, and I guess I would have to say more difficult to uh, to comply with. It seems like double A is is the the earmark, it seems that seems to be where people want to make sure they're compliant. Uh, if you want to be more compliant, then certainly AAA, but AA seems to be enough to satisfy uh, the laws in, in most acts. In the United States, uh, overarching, it's trying to comply with the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's what these WCAG guidelines are meant to try and comply with. The European Commission has a web accessibility policy, and the Government of Canada has a web standards policy. But again, they all kind of relate back into this WCAG 2.0. That's, that's what they're trying to align with. So beyond the law though, you know, what's the moral obligation or the social responsibility? And uh, 
doing a little bit of research, the sur sur I found this statement, which I thought was rather interesting and maybe definitive. So surveys show that up to one in five people or 20% have a disability that affect a disability that affects the way that they use the internet. That was high compared to what I would have thought. Uh, it's, it's accurate. That's not uh, that I'm saying it's not accurate. It's just, it was quite a bit higher than I thought it was going to be. And they say these disabilities encompass physical and cognitive barriers, including colorblindness, full blindness, hearing loss, dyslexia, paralysis, and, and things like that. And so what it really means is without an accessible website, 20% of internet users will encounter difficulties trying to navigate a site. I believe the source for that was siteimprove.com and they have an accessibility handbook, just so uh, in all fairness. So given the 20% number, this 20% number, do you really want to ignore or alienate that large group of users? Just from a, just from a business perspective, you know, can you, can you really stand, stand to ignore that many people or, or make it, make it more difficult for them to use your website? So it, on the flip side of that, if you can achieve compliance, you could actually provide you with a very, very loyal customer base. So if your websites were, were deemed as, as uh, fully accessible, you might find that uh, it, your, your benefit from that is, is more than the 20% that I, that I mentioned there. So again, this, uh, this class action lawsuit. So in my opinion, you probably heard of, of about ambulance chasers, which were lawyers that would follow ambulances around, wait for an act, you know, to get to the accident, and then they'd hand out business cards at the at the accident scene. Well, in my opinion, this has changed now to where they're they're hiring people. I have a vision in my head of what this person might look like, but they're, you know, in my head, they're in a in a in a in the basement in a back corner room in the dark and. They're basically trolling websites looking for ones that have uh, are not compliant for accessibility, and then these uh, these sites are getting added to class action lawsuits, which are expensive and uh, broad. Broad. So the one that uh, our customer that got pulled in was a jewelry store that has a bricks and mortar store in New York, and uh, what the class action lawsuit says basically is because they have a bricks and mortar store that would have to be accessible, meaning you know wheelchair ramps and uh, automatic door openers and, and those kinds of things, then the opinion of the lawsuit um, and perhaps even the courts then is that their website must also be compliant. And this is, uh, this is in the US at least, these are these lawsuits, these class action lawsuits that are getting fired up. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, chances are pretty good you're you're going to. Has anybody else seen that? Well, the W Jack, the WCAG, it's the 508 that that I believe pertains to the federal government agency websites only. The WCAG are the guidelines that the 508 point to as uh, as what you need to be compliant to. So. My belief is that the WCAG 2.0 are the guidelines for web, web accessibility and the 508 is simply saying as of January 2018, if you're a federal website, you need to comply with those, with those guidelines. Hopefully that makes sense and I hope I'm correct on that. And again, feel free to clarify if, uh, if I've misstated that or, or I'm on the wrong track. Now, has anybody else come across these... Uh, these class action lawsuits? Does anybody else know of a client that's been hit with them? Yeah, or should I be surprised that that's happening in, uh, in Australia there yet? It seems to be a US thing at this particular point in time, but, uh, but I suspect it's coming. And these, I guess also these WCAG guidelines are also worldwide where the 508 is, uh, is a US only context. Yeah, Arsh, I, I can appreciate you want to laugh a little bit about it, but uh, I guess I wouldn't. I'll, I'll share a little bit more. I live in a, in a condominium, and uh, it's a strata council, or there's a council that manages the building, and, and we've just been hit as a building. There's some 40 units here, 
we have to cough up $25,000 for a wheelchair ramp for one tenant. Um, it has nothing to do with, with, with legislation or, or, or laws. It's uh, human rights. Uh, the human rights code is, is, is what it's been applied under. And basically, we've checked with lawyers and they say, you know, you can take it to court and you can try, but they are like 99% sure that the other side would win. And then we'd have not to not just build the ramp, but we'll also have to pay penalties and stuff on top of that. So uh, it's, it's challenging. And, and I, I mean, I, I want to say I'd like to be supportive of it, of accessibility and all the rest of it. But uh, in this case, it's $25,000 uh, because it happens to be around common property to put in a ramp for one person. Uh, seems to be excessive, especially when that person can access their, their unit from the building. They just can't get to it from the outside like because uh, there's steps there. But it's really bizarre. So this, this is really coming forward. Uh, I guess I kind of describe it as a bit of like the next round of the Me Too stuff if you follow that in the States. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I, I'd like to hear some perspective from that side if you feel like sharing it. But you know, I'm, I'm torn because uh, this person can get to their unit, but this, this human, human rights code says um, equal access is what it describes as, and that if anybody else can walk out their front door to the, to the stairs, then, then this person should be able to as well. Even though there's a back door with full wheelchair access into the building, elevators and all the rest of that, but you're, they can't go out their front door and down the two or three steps to the park. And, this is why this ramp needs to be built. So it's, it, it's, uh, it can be some difficult things to understand and, 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 and just say, you know what, it's, uh, it's just, you know, the moral and social obligations that we have. It's, uh, that's, I guess that's, that's what it falls back to. Yeah. You kind of, thanks, Hirsch. Uh, we kind of bounce around a bit about that and, and, you know, you want to be, you want to be reasonable. You want to be fair until you hit $25,000 and go, well, that's a lot of money when all you gotta do is go at your back door. But there's challenges with that too. But this, this stuff is coming forward uh, more and more. And I, I personally believe it's just going to become, it's gonna come farther and farther to the front. In many cases, as it should. In some cases, perhaps it's, it's uh, the pendulum has swung a bit too far, but that might be my opinion. But. Yeah, or if it was on private property, there is uh, some government grants and funds available for it. But because it's co it's considered common property, it falls to the uh, to the strata or to the, the managing body to to take care of this. So. Anyway, my point overall is that uh, th this this type of stuff is coming forward more and more, and uh, much like some of these other challenges in 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 the community, uh, it should in, in a lot of ways. And there's going to be the occasional thing where perhaps it might go too far. But uh, in the meantime, this is, this is what we're faced with. Uh, Mark says some website owners of two of his associates have received demand letters to pay and comply. They updated their sites and paid the lawyers off. Yeah. There's uh, like, once you hit with one of those lawsuits, it's, it can be a challenge to get out of that. And then really the, well, as we'll get into it, even complying doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to be, you're going to avoid uh, getting drawn into one of these things. So let me uh, just carry on here. And yeah, sorry, Mary. And, and yes, they shouldn't have to go through the back. And that's this equal access thing. And that was until it was explained to me that it was hard for me to understand why we had to spend this money when I mean, I moved into this building because I'm getting older and I wanted to be in an accessible building. So I did check and the whole building is accessible. But these particular units are on the first floor and they have entrances from the outside as well as from the inside. And uh, it's this, it's equal access. If I can walk out the stairs of their front door and go to the park, then, then anybody should be able to. And that's, it was a bit of a challenge to understand that. I think I do now and I'm making my peace with it, but uh, it's interesting. And yes, it, uh, it can be, it's a lot of money. So as far as websites are concerned, what are the main things to check? And these are, again, these are just my opinion. This is just based on my experience so far. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to, to, of course, to share it with you. And if you have uh, more information or, or your own opinion, feel free to share it. So the first thing I, I kind of ran through is this ARIA, A-R-I-A, and that stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And it's a set of attributes that define ways to make web content and web applications more accessible to people with disabilities. And uh, there's a link which I'll provide in the show notes. And that's kind of the, the initial step. And, and uh, if I look at my notes here, it was things like uh, adding roles. So I had to add a role to a tab list if it was a, an unordered list. Uh, you add an ARIA label of main menu and role equal navigation to, to, my, to our main menus. Um, the search tool, there's a button there for search. It needed to be ARIA label equals search. Uh, those kinds of things. And... Yeah, so it, it, it wasn't that bad, it, uh, but it was a matter of just making sure that, that screen readers and, and, and assistance type technologies are able to understand the context of your website. That's really what that's about. Uh, color contrast, that's the next thing to look at. So you need to make sure, that, and I'll show you a tool later that can help, but there has to be for, for AA, uh, like a ratio of 4.51 a difference between whatever you're looking at and the background. So, you know, the whole light gray text on a white background doesn't fly anymore as far as accessibility goes. Uh, and Chrome DevTools has done an update where you can easily check that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, high contrast. So there, again, there's a plugin where you can set your website to be high contrast. So there are people that need it to be um, white text on a black background. They need that really high contrast in order to be able to see it. In some cases, they want to set it for black and white if there's uh, an issue with color blindness and such, uh, or even just a single color blindness. Some people can't see green or some people can't see red. So there's these high contrast plugins that allow people to change that. And, and again, I'll talk about the tool where, where you can see that. Uh, screen readers is the next thing. And uh, there's JAWS, which is, uh, which is a bit of money. But in Chrome, they have... Uh, uh, Box Chrome or Chrome Box, I can't remember which it is. I think it's Box Chrome. And you can turn that on and and have, if you want some, you want an interesting experience uh, without doing anything, turn it on for one of your websites and just see how people that need to use a screen reader experience your website. And, and if that doesn't give you some motivation for uh, for maybe make some, cha some changes, I don't know what else will. Um, big one I had a, a lot of work with was tabbing, focus, and navigation, just being able to tab through a website. And uh, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll ask for a volunteer and we'll bring their site up and, and try and tab through it and you'll see what we mean. Then there's uh, Zoom. So, you know, in Chrome, you can go command or control plus, 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 plus up to 200%. There's also a text Zoom. And it's, I seem to be finding that text Zoom is not as popular and may not be necessary for compliance if you go with a regular Zoom. Uh, text Zoom causes a lot of problems where most responsive websites are able to Zoom uh, quite simply and, and, and very responsibly and, and not have many issues. That particular jewelry site worked really well for just straight Zoom, but as soon as I tried to do a text-only Zoom, uh, lots of things broke. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, headers and hierarchy, you need some semantic structure. You've got to be using H1s, H2s, H3s, sections, asides. You should be uh, using those kinds of things appropriately. Image alt tags, of course. You want to avoid images containing text because it's not readable. And at a minimum, you should make sure that the alt text matches what's contained in the image text. Um, also remember that zoomed images can pixelate text. And uh, this was an interesting aside for me is dyslexic, dyslexic users won't be able to select your text and have it read. So uh, people that are, are working through dyslexic, dys, dyslexia often will have screen readers where they highlight text and have it read to them. Well, if the text is in your image, they can't do that. If, uh, if an image is linked, use the alt tag to describe the destination of the link, which I thought was a good... Uh, was a good ad. So if you have an, an A tag around your image, make sure that the alt tag in the image describes where, the, if they click that image, where it's going to go. Um, this is this might be a challenging one. Avoid read more or click here. And uh, I've got a tool I'm working with, even on our Chicago Digital website. And there's lots of places where it's you know read more or learn more or 
you know, click here. The linked text, according to the guidelines, should really be descriptive of the destination. And I guess I added my note here that uh, this is contrary to most designs I've worked with. I, most of them say read more or, or click here, and especially blog posts, it's always read more. So uh, they're suggesting that that is, that is not good, particularly for screen readers. So you can imagine having a screen reader, it brings up a summary of all the links on the page and maybe you get five menu items and you get 45 read mores. I mean, where, where would you go? It's, uh, it's not real descriptive. And Mary says, what's the difference between title and alt tags in a link for accessibility? Um, well, the alt tag is in the image, not in the link itself. The title is for, is for the link and the alt is, is I'm talking about for the image. So if the image is linked, you want to make sure the alt tag for the image describes where that link is going to take them is what I was trying to say. Hopefully that makes more sense. And uh, she also hates click here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. Uh, it also said avoid using the page URL as the text link. And again, I've seen this a lot. The, the link should be descriptive. Wherever the href goes, that's fine. But don't just have it, you know, put uh, slash blog slash whatever the title is. Uh, that they're suggesting that that's not really appropriate. Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it, Ursula? So Ursh says, uh, if it's just a button, there's not really room for additional info. So that is one of the challenges. And maybe that's the, uh, the title tag that, uh, that Mary alluded to. So at least if you hover over it, the title can say where it's going to go. And yeah, learn more. I, I don't know exactly where this one's headed or it's, uh, I mean, we, we, I'm constantly working with designers who are, they want things pixel perfect. They, if you, if you're one pixel out or two pixels out, they notice and they, and they say something. So, you know, to tell them that, uh, sorry, your, your learn more button is not going to work. Um, it needs to be something else is, is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Uh, a skip navigation link, and I'll show you that later. So when you get to a page, if you push the tab key, really the first thing that should happen is a little, a, a pop-up or a slide down basically that allows someone to skip right to the main content rather than having to tab through the entire navigation, particularly with, uh, if it's a mega menu, that can be challenging. So I'll, I'll share what I'm working on with that. So those to me are the, are kind of the low hanging fruit, if you will. I'm not suggesting they're easy to resolve, but those are the main things to check at least to get started. So some of the tools I've looked at, um, AX, A, X, E, little a, big X, little E, that's a Chrome plugin. And I got a fair ways with that. That's a free tool. And you, uh, you basically load it and then, then you open up dev tools, you click analyze and it gives you uh, a pretty comprehensive list of the issues it wants you to have a look at. So I did get a fair bit of stuff done with that. I'm looking at my list of things that I fixed there. And uh, this was just on our starting framework. So it's like one page. And I fixed almost 20 items just using that ax tool, which was free. I also uh, found Site Improve. That's another Chrome plugin. Uh, there is a subscription service along with that, and it's frankly uh, one of the things we're considering. It is not inexpensive, but it is comprehensive. But uh, at the very least, they're just the Chrome plugin is is also free, and uh, it it provided some value as well. There's a Wave tool, W A V E, which seemed to be decent. Uh, and they all three do basically the same thing. So it really comes down to trying them and seeing which one is easiest to work with for your workflow. There's a high contrast Chrome plugin, which again, I'll try and show you later. Uh, Vox Chrome, so I was right on that. That's the screen reader. And uh, on an Apple or Mac, you also have uh, a built-in built uh, speech reader. Uh, I did find Vox Chrome to be a little bit easier to work with than, than the built-in Mac one. And then this, uh, on Chrome, this DevTool Color Picker, which, uh, which I'll show you. And it's there by default if you have the latest Chrome, but it's, it's pretty cool, actually. So maybe I'm going to show that to you. 
as the next thing here. So share screen. There we go. All right. So this is uh, this is our starting framework, and it's just it's it's based on the foundation framework. It's what we use to to start all of our websites. It ends up being our uh, our style guide as well. But this is basically what we start with. So the, some of the things I've done. So when I load this page. And when I push tab, you see the first thing that happens is it says uh, skip to main content. So if I hit enter now, it will drop me right down into this area and I skip all the navigation. If I continue to press tab, you can see now I go to the logo, which is a link and you can see the blue outline and that I'll talk about how I did that. And then it just basically steps through the menu. So you see why you got that skip main content because it allows you to skip that entire menu. And I jump up to search. I can't really see my chat just now. Let me see if I can open that in a separate window. There I can. Just give me a sec to see what that was. Oh, you're typing to each other. So yeah, so you, you can see now when I start to use the mouse, how my blue halo goes away. And when I start to use the mouse, the blue halo comes back. So I've, I did find a little bit of snip of the code that uh, turns that off and on. It looks for the first time you press tab. And then if that's there, it applies a body style. And then I'm using that body style to, to hide or show the, the default outline in the web browsers. And then you basically tab through all the links. So again, if you want some fun, uh, open up your website and try and tab through and, and see what you get. And then you get things like on focus. You got you to make sure you handle all that. And then you get down to these things. You got to work with a space bar like that or with the enter key, these slide toggles. Then you get into accordions and they got to work with space bar or slide toggles. And then you get into tabs and they got to work with space bar or enter keys. So you work through all that and then we have a little button on the bottom here, pulls out our style guide. And it's like a table of contents and you can, you can go from there. So that was, that was a lot of hours of work just to get this starting framework to a place where we felt it was uh, as accessible as it could be. Now, when I build a site here, I'm going to change this, obviously change this navigation to whatever the design is. Things move around. I'm going to have to to change things based on the design. And, uh, it's, it's one of the challenges is making sure that your stuff stays compliant. Now I did want to show you this, uh, this Chrome dev tool. So here's ax and you can see I've already run an analysis here. So it's showing up these aria attributes must conform to valid values. And this is one of the last things I got to figure out. It's, it has to do with these tabs. It's wanting an ID that I'm not sure I want to put on there yet. So I haven't really deciding decided yet, but it wants, it wants a matching ID. So whatever, the tab links to it wants the content to have a, to have a matching ID. And then this elements must have sufficient color contrast. I, I kind of, I haven't decided what I'm going to do about that, but it's basically this little drop down here is, uh, is what the, is what the issue is. So this little, whatever you call that little widget thingy that, uh, that makes the, the select box open. That's what it's complaining about. Everything else though has been, uh, has been resolved. So that's the ax thing. Let me go up to the colors here. So here's some colors. Um, let me just choose that one. So I've got the, the, uh, the body color is probably not the best choice. Yeah, so here's the swatch color with a, with a dark red on it. If I click the color and it brings up the the color picker you can see now that there's a contrast ratio here and if i click that you can see this line in the color picker uh, so it tells me that 4.53 is is compliant up to double a it's not compliant up to triple a which would be seven but what i liked was it gives me a, a line here that shows me what's compliant and what's not 
So if I go to this, uh, this blue, again, it's showing me that the contrast ratio is compliant and you can't really see it, but it's, it's over here, this little dot and I'm way below the line. So it's a, it's a pretty cool way to, to check, I thought anyway, for this compliance. Uh, let me see if this shows up. Yeah, this is because it's a background color. It doesn't uh, it doesn't work on that one. Now again, I've I've fixed all these, um, so it's not really, I mean, it's not really a good way to, to show you the a tool that or a place that's out of compliance. But this was one of them I had to adjust, and I think I've just oh, yeah. So I am double A at three dot zero in that particular case. Uh, just because of the context and AAA would be 4.5. So I'm not compliant on that. So that's a pretty cool tool and it's, it's already in there. You just have to know to, uh, to look for it. it. I just happened across it and then you have to know to click it to get this little line up top there. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, I can't really show you on that screen. So here's this high contrast tool. When I enable it, you can see it converts everything to the, to the opposing color. And you have some choices here, increased grayscale, grayscale, inverted color. Uh, you can have yellow on black. So you, you can choose these and turn it off and on. But that's, again, there are people that use this tool. That's the way they need to, to navigate the web. So you wanna make sure you're checking it to make sure um, that your website will comply. And what else did I talk about? Let's check my notes here. Yeah, the tabbing we went through. So if you, again, if you want some fun, well, here I'll just uh, I'll expose expose us for what we currently are, and we're in the process of rebuilding our website anyway. But so I'm not sure if you can see this or not. So if you look at the status bar down the bottom left corner here, you can, you can see the links as I'm tabbing, but you have no indication on the screen of where, of where you're tabbing. There's, we've, we've turned off that outline, which is what a lot of people do. We you turn off that outline and imagine someone coming landing on this site who needs to use the keyboard to navigate. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm hitting tab repeatedly, you can hear it. I've got no indication on the screen as to what's happening versus this experience where you tab and, and you can you can clearly see where you are. And again, once I start using the mouse, that little, sorry about that one, but the blue, uh, the blue links stuff goes away. So it's not like you can't manage it. You just have to have a little plugin that, uh, that looks for that little tab key. And the zoom, so yeah, the zoom was, uh, let me just show you. So now I'm just doing command plus and you can see the zoom. So you have to be good up to 200%. And of course you wanna look through and make sure everything worked the way it's supposed to. Get rid of this. Now the other thing is, I've, and again I found another plugin where it zooms text only and you can see in the bottom left corner. And I've got this largely handled. It, uh, it does respond properly. But again, if I go to Chicago Digital and I start to zoom text only, you can see it's not very long before things start to uh, start to break. This is actually not too bad, but you, you can see there are lots, lots of troubles versus zooming with command plus and that, uh, that, that fires up the responsive nature of your, of your website. So using, using command plus is the responsive side, this whole text only. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure you can see here, even the, uh, even the mobile menu kicked in at 200%, even though I'm on a desktop. 
So that largely works really well. It's this text-only Zoom, and I, I have yet to find a definitive answer. How does mobile come into play on tabs? Well, you don't tab on a phone, Jack. There's a, I, I appreciate what you're, I appreciate your question because I had, I had exactly the same question. And uh, if I'm, I'm assuming that if you don't have, if you have a phone, you, I mean, you, you have to be able to press it. There is no keyboard. So I, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you on that. Maybe someone else might. I, I think the assumption is if you have a tablet or a phone that you're going to be touching the screen with something. I think that I think that has to be the assumption. And again, I did have that exact same question. So just looking through my notes here. And again, if you're if you're zooming here up to two hundred percent. Oh, you see now I broke that. Yeah, I think I've got, this is a text only Zoom. So this was the best I could make it look and it's, it still overlaps. And God knows how many, this is with five links. You know, if your client has more links than they often do, it's just something you have to consider because there, there are people that will be viewing your site that way. Get everything back to zero. And if I'm just zooming with the browser, then my mobile, my mobile site kicks in and that's all fine. Um, even here, I've got this set up so at least you can tab through these links. So maybe that answers your question, Jack. So this could be someone who has just zoomed your site, they're on a desktop. But because they zoomed it, the mobile menu kicks in. So you still have to make it tabable, I guess is what I'm really saying there, Jack. You know, if you're on a tablet or, or a phone, it's, it's reasonable to assume they're going to be touching it. But uh, if they're on a desktop and it, it happens to be zoomed enough to kick in the, the mobile part of it, you still have to make sure you can tab through this stuff. And you have to make sure when you hit escape that the menu goes away. Definitely things you, uh, you have to consider. And I think I can stop sharing the screen now. So talk a little bit about what I've learned so far. I, I guess I would say navigation has been the biggest challenge. That's what I've spent the most time on. I know it looked fairly straightforward to get to just tab through that menu. That was a fair bit of work to get that to work in a way that I felt was, uh, was reasonable uh, and appropriate for somebody. I'm still not quite done. I'd like to get it so when you got to that menu, if you hit the right arrow, it'll go to the next item in the, in the list. Um, I have not been able to get that to work well yet. So for now, they have to tab through the whole menu. And I'm not 100% fussy about that, but at least it's, uh, it's better than it was, which you couldn't even tab into it before. So yeah, I would say navigation is probably going to be one of your biggest challenges. And again, even mobile nav needs to be looked at if the page is zoomed. When the, so the mobile, mobile nav triggers uh, sooner, then you're going to need to make sure it's keyboard navigable. Um, I would say working with screen readers is challenging. I definitely went through, uh, when you first fire up Vox Chrome, there's a tutorial available and I went through that and, uh, and I needed it. I really did need it. It, uh, it took a little while to, to even remotely master the, the commands and then see if I could navigate the page, uh, and then to, to fix the page so that it navigated as a, as a, as I expected it to. And then I, like the spec wants more than a color change for links, and I don't have my answer on this yet. So it's suggesting when you hover over a link, just changing the color of the link is not enough. Uh, it's looking for a symbol to be added or an underline or some other visual change besides a color change. So I haven't decided what we're gonna do about that yet. Uh, the simplest answer is to make sure it underlines or something or leave that in place, but the designers aren't happy about that. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you have a, have a suggestion on that, but that's say the spec wants more than a color change. They're saying that that's not enough. So that's, uh, I've learned that. I don't have an answer for it yet. And, uh, I said, turning off that little blue halo is bad. 
That's uh, that's what I wrote. And then I said, but I have, I've been testing this, this code that senses for that tab press and then adds a body style, which then shows that blue outline. I, and I think that's an appropriate answer. Uh, the challenge is I won't know until <laughs> basically someone sues us or something, uh, if it's 100% compliant or not. Uh, fixing the ARIA issues was, was fairly straightforward and does not really impact the design or layout. So those are, that's kind of low hanging fruit. Form fields, particularly radio and check boxes, seem to be an issue with text only. Uh, it took me a little bit of work to get those to work right. If you go to a, one of your websites and just do a command or control plus 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 on a form that has check boxes, I think you'll see what I mean. There, there was a bit of work to get that to, to zoom properly. Form labels seem to be an area of focus. And I'm just said it's not likely, it's likely not a good idea to turn them off. So we have a lot of designers that, uh, that want to have placeholders for the form labels. And these standards are saying, don't do that. Uh, or at least, it, and then if, if you do, then there's some things you can do with the ARIA labels and stuff to, to make it compliant. But they're basically saying, you know, don't do that. They also want you to use field set and legends in your forms. Yeah, it's a pretty big Pandora's box, Mary. But uh, say if you get hit with one of these class action lawsuits, it's it's literally thousands of dollars to resolve the issues and to and to comply with the lawsuit and and potentially uh, punitive damages, which is what this jeweler in New York is facing. Uh, tables need proper markup to be compliant. That means uh, table headers and footers. You need to, you know, TH, T body, those kind of things need to be in place for a, for a proper table. So what I did find is there is lots of interpretation. Even the WCAG guidelines, they give examples of what's compliant and examples of what's not compliant without, in my opinion, without being completely specific. So you can read the guidelines and still not be sure if your application of it is compliant or not. Uh, none of this is, is as black and white or cut and dry as, as perhaps it could be. So they, they try and give you examples of, hey, this, is, this looks good and this is not good. And you've got to try and figure out if you're, if you're in the good camp or the not good camp. Uh, one thing you may not think about, but staying compliant is something you need to consider. And I say that since uh, these ambulance chasing lawyers are following you right now. So just having the site compliant when, when you launch, I think is, uh, is not going to be enough. You could wind up um, with changes to the site, whether by your client or even, even your, your own developers and stuff. You could f find yourself out of compliance in a year or two and in the exact same lawsuit you were trying to avoid. Now one ray of hope um, one ray of light, I guess, maybe, is that if you are hit with a lawsuit, apparently, it seems to be, and I have exa examples of this, but showing how you are working towards compliance may be enough to keep your feet out of the fire. Uh, yeah, Mary. So Mary says it will help if we as webmasters are making a good intention to comply. And that's what this line is about. So if you are hit with a lawsuit, uh, precedence has been set where if you're able to show the efforts that you made and, and, and the ongoing efforts that you're making, uh, often the court will rule in your favor, meaning uh, you still have to do it, but there won't be puni necessarily punitive damages or, or penalties associated. So this, this has actually happened where a, a company showed, you know, they were hit with a lawsuit, they showed that they were trying to comply on the tools that they're using and the, and the efforts that they've been making, and they were able to show one of the tools we're looking at this site improve uh, gives you the ability to export your reports so you can show your compliance over time. So you can show the improvements you made over time. And that apparently holds a fair bit of weight uh, in, in, uh, in, in the courts. So, small ray of light. Now this will, uh, if this doesn't make you shiver, I don't know what else will, but video and audio could be significant issues as it looks like you need to have them captioned or have transcripts available in order to be compliant. So think about that. I, I take this recording of this sand pile and I post it up on YouTube. And in reality, I'm supposed to be either captioning that 
we're providing a transcript of that. So this is an hour long recording. In theory, I'm supposed to be going through and pulling out all the words that I'm currently saying and providing those in a transcript and, and anything you might say, including the chats and stuff. That scares the crap out of me, frankly. But that's, that's what I'm starting to believe. That's what I'm seeing. I may be wrong. There are some tools uh, that will do it. You still need to go through and check. So you can, you can have a tool, go pull out all your, all your words and put them into text, but you still have to read them all and make sure it did a good job. So you're right, Ursh. I mean, some of that could be done for you, and you can hire it out too. But uh, with how popular videos are becoming, that scares me. And Mary, you might be right. It might be up to interpretation. Oh, the text-to-speech part of it. And, and even the fact that it needs to be done that way, uh, that's what I'm reading. That's what I'm reading into it, and, I, and I, I'm still waiting for – got to find a way to, to – to firm that up and, and know whether that's a hundred percent real or not. But that, that particular thing scares me. So something else, uh, users need adequate time. So if an element does something that's time-based like a notification, so say someone does something and you, you put a pop-up for 10 seconds and then, and then take it off the screen, you can't do that anymore. Uh, they need people either, or you have to allow someone to change that time how long it shows up for. So they either, they either have to be able to uh, change the time or have it not go away. They need, they need time to interact with that element. And that goes for any element that is time-based on your page. Slideshow, they, they need to be able to adjust to either stop it, pause it, or adjust the time that the slides go by. So just having a slider now that does not have controls, uh, I believe is not going to fly anymore. Yeah, Mary, and, and the whole purpose of that is for, for people that can't hear. Uh, and while, I, while I, I can agree with that in principle, the, uh, the number of videos that I watch even um, and the fact that they're going to have to subtitle these things just makes me, it makes my head spin. So I'm not sure what we're going to do about that. So yeah, adequate time. Uh, again, they have to either be, be able to pause it or, or stop it altogether and, uh, or adjust the time. Uh, blinking text is bad because it uh, it can it's been known to cause seizures. So content should not blink more than three times a second. So I'm not sure if anybody's using blinking text anymore or blinking anything anymore. But um, even something I guess as simple as a as a as a video where you know you're getting this on the screen could be considered non-compliant. So. I'm just reading Mary's comment where Jack says, hmm, I don't see Facebook website doing any of this. Uh, well, Jack, if you go to Facebook and push the tab key, you'll see at least some of their accessibility. They actually have a bar that comes down and there's menus to access some of the content and, uh, and stuff like that. I, I know that because I've been looking at it uh, because we might do something similar. Mary says, I can look at this as another reason to quit be being in the website business or I can be someone who knows this stuff and gets paid for it, if that makes sense. Uh, that's exactly the way I look at it, Mary. So mm, frankly, my, my goal is to become an expert of this as much as I possibly can, and it becomes a profit center as opposed to an expense. Um, it's, it's figuring out how to charge for it because it, it definitely takes uh, a lot more time. But even to be seen as a web agency that's, uh, that can say that their websites are compliant I think holds some weight if you're there's, if there's five proposals in the room and only one of them says that they're com, they're going to be accessibly compliant. Uh, I even if it's a bit more money, I think there's some value in that. So, uh, moving or scrolling content, a user should be able to pause, stop, adjust the speed, or hide this content. So that uh, I think I kind of alluded to that before, where they need they need time, but. Uh, Users need to be able to adjust those, uh, those interactive elements. And uh, documents, including PDFs, need to be compliant. I haven't quite figured out what that looks like yet, but I, I thought I'd share that little snippet with you. So even if you make downloadable PDFs or provide them, they need to be accessibly compliant.
Uh, so if you're doing that, do some research, figure out what that looks like, and uh, or maybe we'll cover it in another another session sometime. But. And then uh, this was a surprise to me. I need to do some more research on mobile screens, mobile screen readers. So apparently usage of mobile screen readers, so on your phone where the phone reads out the text on the page, has increased from 12% to 82% between 2009 and 2014. Um, I find it hard to believe that 82% of people are using screen readers. So I, I went back and that's the way I interpret the numbers, but even if those numbers are wrong, the fact that people are using a, a screen reader on a mobile phone, um, even if it's 25% of the people are doing that, it's still, it's a user group that you don't, uh, you just can't afford to ignore anymore. Yeah, yeah, Siri when driving, it, it, I mean, it could be a lot of things, but yeah. It's uh, what I'm really saying is something you want to, you want to make sure you understand and, and, and not ignore, I guess. So yeah, it may not be to a disability, but maybe just because they're using Siri. Um, but the fact of the matter is they're trying to browse your website and they're using a screen reader. So whether it's a disability or not, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Mary, I don't mean to, to depress you. Uh, what I do want to bring forward though, is that, is that you at least have an awareness uh, that this stuff is out there. And if only half of what I'm presenting comes to the front, uh, you need to be, you need to educate yourself on it and figure out what you're going to do about it, I guess is what I'm saying. So I, uh, I, as, as a, an end note here, I said, if time allows, does anyone want to have a look at one of their sites and see how it fares with what I know today? So if you want to give me a URL, I'll share the screen and uh, I'll basically go through the tabbing and the zooming and some of the color contrast stuff and, and, and do that if someone wants. We got a, you know, another five minutes or so. So I'm happy to do that if someone wants to throw a link. Or we can uh, just listen to Mary sing because she has yet to cough that up for me after months, weeks and weeks of, of, of cajoling. While you marry. Often it's the other Mary, but uh, you're the Mary that's here today, so. Not gonna happen, yeah. See, that's what you say every time. Yeah, but that, that Mary said no as well, so. <laughs> yeah, so try not to get too scared about it. I, I guess I've been through the five stages like everybody else. Uh, you know, denial and all the rest of that stuff and um, anger and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna, uh, Thanks to Mary Higgins for, for sharing that. I'm going to share that screen. Uh, there it is. Maybe we can do a duet. Well, I, uh, I only sing uh, Frank Sinatra, and, and that's only karaoke after multiple drinks. So, so thanks, Mary. This is uh, one of Mary's sites. And the first thing I would do when I load this page is I'm just going to refresh it so i am got a fresh page. So when I push the tab key, that's a good sign. Then I get the home. Now I get about, it's not horrible. So I'm able to tab through those elements. So that's pretty cool. Um, but I can't get to those menus. Can I? Yeah, down arrow doesn't work. So I, in this, and I had the same problem with my framer too, Mary. This isn't a, a criticism of you in any way, shape, or form. So that's the first thing I came across was I couldn't get into any of the submenus with the, with the tab key. And then, uh, yeah, my blue hail is around that button and that button, so that seems to be okay. Then I move into these tweets. That's largely okay. Although now I'm kind of stuck in this loop. I can't get out of that till I get to the very end. And you can see the scroll bar there, how <laughs> I'm literally holding the tab key down to get to the bottom of this thing. So they would say that that is not going to work. And then where did I go? Oh, I went down below to the community partners. And oh, there I'm in join the fun. I don't know where I am there, join the fun. I, Tab through those. 
So for the most part, it's not bad. Yeah, I can get to, for the most part, I, I can get to where I need to go. That's not too bad. So other than this main menu with, the, uh, with these, this hover state, so someone who's uh, using a keyboard can't get to those. So now let's try the whole Zoom thing. Well, I got to open that chat window again, in case Mary's calling me. Ah, okay, so Mary, Mary's denying all knowledge, saying it's not her site, but it's one, it's a local one for our people, okay? So let's try the Zoom. Interesting. It's not allowing me to zoom. <laughs> so there must be must be something on the page. Uh, Mary, am I interpreting this right? In that this should be an accessible website, just because it's uh, dedicated to, to the special education of of, uh, of your area. There is that right? Yeah, I would think so too. So I'm just going to refresh to make sure. Oh, there we go. So I must have done something with my keyboard. So zoom in to 200%. Yeah, that looks all right, eh? So I think they're good that way. Go back to zero. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do text zoom. Three, up to 100 and up to 200% it's gotta go. And even that looks not too bad. I think that's I think that's compliant, in my opinion. I think the only challenge there is is not not being able to get into those menus using uh, the keyboard. And there's also no uh, skip to main content link comes up, which seems to be a standard. I also had to work with you see that blue the blue halo gets cut off on the right hand side. It took me a bit of work to figure out how to make sure that always surrounded the entire element. So the next thing is, uh, let's do this contrast thingy. Yeah, I'd say that's largely okay. If someone was, was using that as a, as a tool. Inverted grayscale, grayscale, increased contrast, normal. So I would say that's uh, that's good that way. And then let's just do this uh, inspect. So I'm just going to do an analyze on with axe here and see what it comes up with. So 125 items must have sufficient color contrast. Clearly color contrast is a, is a concern on this site. And then you can, I can do the, uh, the highlight. It'll show me. So it doesn't like that button. Uh, I can go to the next one, the welcome. And if I want to check that, I can just do that. And um, I'm going to have to refresh because it's got the axe stuff on it. So now let me just check this welcome. That's an H1. And if I check this color. So the contrast ratio you can see here is 2.65. So in order to make it compliant, I just have to move that below. And that's, again, there's a level of compliance there, right? You got to decide how compliant you want to be. So if you're trying for A or double A, this is double A three point zero. So maybe I read that wrong. I thought it was four point five to one, but maybe I'm wrong. But uh, at least it helps you. Like it, it wasn't much of a move to get it where, to where it needed to be in this case, right? So when I load this. When I first loaded that, you can see I'm just above the line. I don't really have to change it much to get it to be compliant. Now, again, you're talking someone's design or style guide um, that you're playing with, and they may not like you doing that. But 
they probably don't want to be <laughs> pulled into a class action lawsuit either. Uh, HTML element must have a language attribute, quite a common problem. So lang equals English. Links must have discernible text. That's where it's, uh, um, yeah. So there's supposed to be some kind of an attribute here that tells a screen reader what those are. Doesn't really, it doesn't really say, and the screen reader may not know is really what they're saying. Heading level should only increase by one level. I've seen this quite a bit. So when you go from H1 to H3, it doesn't necessarily like that. Text for buttons and links should not be repeated. So where is that? Interesting. So that's highlighting the image. So those must link somewhere. And uh, the alt tag might be just the same thing or the, you, you kind of have to, I guess I can do inspect node. So there's a figure there. Volunteer is creating, I bet, I bet you if I check those other ones, they're all the same alt tag is what I think it might be complaining about. And if I'm wrong, well, no, apparently I'm wrong. Oh, well, lazy owl, no, that won't be it. So I don't know what it's complaining about. You kind of have to dig in a bit. It does give you some, some text and stuff that you can, you can do more research on. But I used this tool and found a fair bit of stuff. Uh, this whole landmark thing was interesting as well. Uh, I just recognize that we're past the hour here. So I'm going to stop this, the screen share. And I appreciate you hanging in for just that little bit longer. Uh, what was that tool you, you could use to show that you were improving? That's a site improve, S-I-T-E improve. And that's, again, that's a subscription service. It is not inexpensive, but it is comprehensive. And that was one of the things we liked about it. It also allows you to do QA and SEO. And you can even set, you can even set your, your client specific rules, if you will. So if someone adds, uh, you can say all H1s must be this color. And if, if someone adds something and they change the color, it'll pop up in the tool as a, on, during the weekly scan as, hey, you should have a look at this. So it's a pretty comprehensive tool, but again, it's not inexpensive. Uh, whether it's expensive or not, well, that's that's up to you. Thanks, Laura. I uh, again, I'll I'll try and assemble in the show notes a couple of links that that might be of interest to you, and, and maybe I'll just take my my note PDF here and uh, and, and put that in there. And uh, hope I didn't scare you too much, uh, Mary. I wouldn't want to affect uh, your ability to sleep at night, but it's definitely coming your way in my opinion, and it's definitely worth looking at for not just for legal reasons, but for, for moral and social obligations as well. It's, it is the right thing to do. Uh, all the tools I think have been there for a long, long time. We just haven't used them. You know, we've, we've kind of uh, been ignoring them because, you know, we don't have those challenges. So you, you kind of forget to, to make sure, make sure you're, you're using those tools that are available. And Mary's been awakened, yeah. Sleepless nights, she's going to lay there when she goes to bed tonight and go, like, damn, Dave, damn, Dave. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to hang out for a few more minutes here in case uh, someone has any questions, but that's, that's the bulk of it. I appreciate your, uh, your participation today. And, and thanks, Mary, for coughing up that, uh, that site, even if it wasn't yours. I think it was a reasonable one to, to have a look at. And even someone who should be fully compliant is, uh, is outside of bounds in some areas, right? I didn't even get to a, running it through a screen reader. So. Yeah, you might be right, uh, Ursh, that it's, it's slightly less strict uh, in Australia right now. Um, Canada is kind of like that. It's, it's usually one and a half to two years behind whatever the state's doing. So I suspect it's coming our way, and it might be the same for, for you folks down under, as it were. Cool. I'm just waiting to see if anybody has any questions or comments and then I'm going to call it because Mary has refused to sing. At least uh, she's, she says, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I'll uh, say I'll probably what I'll do is just PDF my, uh, the document I used for um, as an outline here and I'll, I'll include that in the show notes and, 
Thanks, Mark. Have a good night. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.